Hey there. In recent weeks, I've been doing a deep dive on Tunisia in the hopes of coming up with something new and useful to say about the country. My last videos on Tunisia were in the aftermath of the fall 2019 elections for president and parliament. Back then, I was cautiously optimistic, but I emphasized how important it was for Tunisia to get some real economic change and development going. Well, in the years since, Tunisia's gotten pretty much the opposite. The COVID catastrophe, uh, economic shutdown, and even more acute financial distress. Over the past year, I've once again been blown away by the tenacity with which Tunisians have held on to their democratic experiment. In the face of repeated disappointment and an economy that has actually shrunk in the 10 years since the dictatorship, the Tunisian people have persevered. Long after every other post-Arab Spring attempt at democracy has crashed and burned, Tunisia just keeps going. They have done this despite a region full of actors that want to crush democracy and a rising dynamic of nostalgia for dictatorship within Tunisia itself. Tunisian democracy is a magnificent accomplishment. Unfortunately, in my research, I haven't come up with much to say that's new. But I've come to the realization that Tunisia's experience can be used to draw out a general lesson that is extraordinarily important. I believe Tunisia's experience shows that if you want to consolidate a democracy, then economic growth is absolutely essential. This next bit might seem like a bit of straw man punching, but no, it's true. There really is a group of thinkers that maintain that economic growth is the enemy. Degrowth is one of the environmental movement's weirdest children. It takes the obvious point that the world and its resources are finite as its starting point. It's true that if the logic of exponential economic growth continues forever, it's possible to imagine the exhaustion of this world and its resources. The basic point makes sense to me. It's just math, really. Where I differ with degrowthers, though, is on where to put that limit. I see the limit as happening somewhere out in the sci-fi future, after we've exhausted our massive potential for technological and societal innovation. You know, some point out there after we've exhausted the last asteroid. Well, degrowthers think we've already passed that limit today, and they think we have to go back. This idea has been pushed more and more heavily ever since the 1970s, even as worldwide obesity has become a bigger problem than worldwide famine, and we have moved from a world of peak oil to peak oil demand. Degrowthers have now latched on to climate change to make strenuous arguments for political action against the very idea of economic growth. To be clear, there's little danger of these policy recommendations being implemented in the near term. I often wonder if these ideas are becoming more popular in Europe as a sort of way to justify that continent's decade of economic stagnation, sort of an unholy marriage between pro-austerity bankers and the most annoying holier-than-thou hippies. But just because most people think degrowth is a silly idea doesn't mean it isn't dangerous. I think it's important to look at how this degrowth concept has worked in practice. As I've documented recently, many countries in North Africa have now gone a full decade without any real economic growth. Countries like Libya and the Sahel, however, have also dealt with war and dictators, which are factors that make any sort of real analysis much more complicated. There is one country in North Africa that has been free, at peace, and has been trying really hard to implement a better system ever since 2011. It's Tunisia that illustrates degrowth in action most clearly. According to these U.S. Federal Reserve figures, by 2019, Tunisia's GDP had fallen to around $39 billion from $44 billion in 2010, the last full year of dictatorship. Most see this as a cataclysmic failure for Tunisian democracy, but I suppose degrowthers should be pleased and fascinated to see how it's going. It's interesting to note that there was still some economic growth until 2014, at which point Tunisian degrowth really set in. 
It seems pretty obvious to me that Tunisia's post-2014 economic collapse was a result of the worldwide collapse in the oil price, which fell down seven years ago and has yet to get back up again. This illustrates a central truth about Tunisian development that I keep emphasizing, but not enough people recognize. Tunisia's economic collapse isn't really Tunisia's fault, like at all. First off, their neighborhood is a disaster. The old Tunisian dictatorship sat fat and happy in between two oil-rich countries. Tunisian democracy has not been so lucky. Libya was destroyed by NATO in 2011, and the international community continues to support differing warring factions. It's been a constant low-level civil war, and it's an absolute disgrace for the international community. Tunisia has to deal with refugees, spillover terror attacks, and obviously has very little useful trade with Libya. To the west, Algeria is in better shape, but it's still a rotting oligarchy, reliant on oil prices that have been too low for comfort for five years now. And Algeria's teetering oligarchy really doesn't want a successful democracy next door either. Beyond the chaos in the Petro neighbors, the most important factor in Tunisia's economic decline is European stagnation. Europe takes the majority of Tunisia's exports and historically provided the most tourists for Tunisia's beaches. But Europe has experienced a lost economic decade as well. Even the US and China, the twin dynamos of the world economy, had a relatively slow 2010s. Tunisia didn't want degrowth, but degrowth is what Tunisia got. I don't want to completely exonerate Tunisia's leaders here. Of course, there is more that could have been done and should have been done. There always is. But it's important to note just how difficult the situation has been for Tunisia's democratic leadership. If the economic pie is always shrinking, then people are going to be unhappy. And despite this near miraculous decade of democracy in Tunisia, people are very unhappy. The president and the parliament can't seem to work together, and the Tunisian public is wondering what exactly it is they've been fighting so hard for all these years if the reward is unemployment and the best option for educated young people is to leave the country. To make matters worse, as the pie shrinks, the International Monetary Fund and other international lenders keep demanding more austerity measures from the Tunisian government. It's an incredibly vicious cycle. International financial institutions maintain that Tunisia keeps failing because its recommendations haven't been truly implemented. But all of its recommendations require austerity, which means taking even more away from the Tunisian people. Supposedly, it's just supposed to be a year or two of pain, but Tunisia has now been on the IMF merry-go-round for over half a decade. And so far, it's all just pain. Looking at the arguments over economic reform, I'm beginning to come to the conclusion that really everybody's critiques are right. Yes, absolutely, the IMF is asking for things that are impossible and harmful. But at the same time, the Tunisian government is also standing in the way of reform. What the critics on all sides seem to be missing is that Tunisia is not the main problem here. Even the most saintly, perfect, self-sacrificing Tunisian government would have failed at economic reform in the current global context. Who was going to pour in investment money if Tunisia miraculously woke up tomorrow with the societal trust and budget discipline of Switzerland? Libya with its civil war, the European Union, which has spent the past decade nickel and diming its own members over financial crisis and now COVID recovery money? And what were these magical investment dollars going to be poured into? Building a hub for conflict tours of the Sahel? Providing services for an Algerian petrostate that seems to be on the brink of disappearing? The whole Tunisia economic reform conversation strikes me as more than a little bit ridiculous. There is no economic growth, and as of today, I see no story for why there's going to be economic growth. Entrepreneurs need more transparency, sure, but entrepreneurs also need something to do. In a country that has been stripped of most of its traditional sources of economic growth, moving up the World Bank's ease of doing business statistics is 
nice, but it's also kind of pointless. We're talking about margins of margins of margins here. The new openness and political discussion is magnificent, but Tunisian degrowth has driven those discussions in predictable directions. Politics without growth is a zero-sum game, all about hanging on to what you have. When the economic pie is getting smaller and there is nothing new to share out, of course nobody is willing to give anything up. Whether we're talking about labor unions, figures from the old regime, or new politicians, or the general public protesting to hold on to subsidies, this is the world of political possibility that we get from degrowth. There is a lot that could be done better in Tunisia, but the Tunisian people have already done their part. I don't want to demonize the IMF either. I want to demonize the IMF's funders, especially the ones that started this whole degrowth nightmare by destroying Libya 10 years back and have spent the 10 years since pouring billions upon billions of dollars into turning all of North Africa into a high-tech weapons testing range. It is Kafka-esque that a country like Tunisia, which has already sacrificed so much for democracy, is being pushed to the brink of debt default and possibly restored dictatorship over a few handfuls of billions of dollars. And that's exactly the situation we are dealing with here. Respectable commentators are comparing Tunisia's economic situation to Venezuela's. That's hyperbole, but not by much. The people are so frustrated that according to some polls, Abir Moussi's PDL is the most popular party in the country. She wants to ban the second largest party and is openly nostalgic for the old dictatorship. Tunisia has done extraordinarily well for a decade without economic growth, but I'm pretty sure their new democracy can't survive another decade like the last one. Degrowth isn't just hard to implement in a democratic context, it's also actively harmful for democracies. Intellectuals who try to make a virtue out of economic stagnation are making it harder for new democracies to consolidate. Tunisia needs economic growth. If it can't do it itself, which I think by now is pretty clear that it can't, then the NATO countries that blew up North Africa should be giving Tunisia billions of dollars as grants, not loans. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe, and I'd be grateful if you'd sign up for my email list. I'm getting out more content that way recently, and if you sign up, you also get a free PDF essay. Thanks.